In this video, we're creating a calendar table inside Power Query, but we're not going to stop there. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to make that thing dynamic. We're going to add financial periods and financial years for when our financial year end is not in sync with the calendar year end. And we're also going to look at non-standard calendars, such as 445 or 13 four-week periods. The good news is it's exactly the same whether we're working in Excel or Power BI. We've got a lot to get through, so fire our Power Query and let's get started. We're starting with a blank query. So from the home ribbon, click new source, then other sources, then blank query. Now let's rename this query to calendar. Not only are we starting with a blank query, but we're going to open the advanced editor and write some of the code ourselves. Don't worry, you stick with me, we've got this. So from the home ribbon, click advanced editor. Now let's write our code. We want to start with the let keyword, and then we want to declare what our start date is. So we will enter start date equals, then using the date function, we can use the year, the month, and then the day to create a date. We'll then add a comma and then create a new line for our end date, for which we will also use the date function. And we're going to enter 2024, 12, and then 31. We'll enter a comma at the end of that line. And now for the magic, we can now create our date list. So we'll say that date list equals, and we're going to use the list.dates function. The first argument of list.date is the start date. Well, we already have that. That was our start date step. The second argument is the count. This is the number of items that we want in our date list. For this, we're going to use the duration dot days function. If we enter the end date minus the start date, that will give us the number of days in that period. But we also need to add one to make sure that we include the end date in that calculation. The final argument is the step. This is how long each item in the list should last. For this, we're going to use the duration function. This accepts the number of days, the number of hours, the number of minutes, and the number of seconds. Therefore, if we want one day, we'll enter one comma zero comma zero comma zero. Right, we've now written all of our code. We just need to make sure that we return our date list. So we will replace source with date list and then click done. And we've got our dates as a list. Let's convert that into a table by clicking to table. And then in the dialog box, we can click OK. We've now got a table. Let's rename the column from column one to date and change it to a date data type. Now we can add any useful columns that we like. So let's suggest we want to add a year column. With the date column selected, we'll click add column and then in the date section, we'll add a year column. Let's do that again and add a month column. So we will select our date column. Then from the date section, we can select month. And that's it. We can keep adding columns as we need to make sure that our calendar table is perfect for our scenario. Currently, the dates used within the calendar table are hard coded, but let's suggest that we have some data and we always want a calendar table to be in sync with that data. Therefore, we need to get the earliest date from that data and the latest date from that data. To do that, we can change our start date and our end date steps. So let's click start date. And then in the formula bar, we can type equals list.min, open brackets. Then from our transactions table, we want our date column. We can repeat the same thing for the end date, but rather than list.min, we use list.max. So we'll select end date and enter equals list.max, then the transactions table, and then the date column. And now when we go back to the last step in our calendar table, we can see everything still calculates correctly. So when the data inside the transactions table changes, our calendar table will update accordingly. For many of us, our organization's financial calendar does not start on the 1st of January. It might still be calendar months, but the year end might be the end of March, the end of June, or the end of September, or any other month. For this, we can add the financial year and the financial period into our calendar table. To do that, we click Add Column and then Custom Column. Let's call this Financial Year. 
And then the formula that we want to use is date.year, so that will return the year. Within that, we want to use date.addMonths. So this will add a number of months to our date. So if our year end is March, we need to uplift three by nine to make it the 12th month. We can close those brackets and then click OK. That adds the financial year column. Let's change this to a whole number without adding an extra step. In the M code before the last bracket, enter a comma and then type int 64 dot type. This will change the data type of our column to a whole number. Now let's add the financial period. For this, we'll need another custom column. And let's call this financial period. And then the logic is the same as the financial year. So the formula will be equals date.month. So it will return a month number. And in that, we want to use the date.addMonths based on the date. And because we've said that our financial year end is in March, we need to add nine months. We can close those brackets and click OK. And that now adds the financial period. OK, let's change this into a whole number data type by adding the comma and then the int 64 dot type. Now, if we scroll down that calendar table, you can see that we have our financial periods and our financial years based on a March year end. If you work with non-standard calendars, such as a 445 or a 13 four week period, you know how difficult calendars can become because there's always the 53 week year that happens from time to time. So the way to handle this is by being explicit about our calendar and when those periods start and when those periods end. I have another query called period end dates. It contains the date, the financial year and the financial period. And this is based on a 445 calendar. To use this, we can head back to our calendar query and then click home merge queries. The first table is our calendar table and we want the second table to be our period end dates. And we want to merge based on the date column. Because the start date for each of our calendars are unlikely to be the same, we need to include all the dates from both tables. Therefore, we need to use a full outer join. And then we can click OK. We now expand that column, adding the financial year and financial period, but we don't need the column prefix. And then we can click OK. Because our period end dates table only included the period end dates, we see null for any date that wasn't contained in that table. So all we need to do is to click transform, fill, and then up. Any of the dates from our period end dates table, which were outside of our calendar table, will return null in our date column. So therefore we can now filter to remove those null values. And now if we scroll down that calendar table, we now have the financial period based on our non-standard 445 calendar. And that's it. That's how we can create calendar tables inside Power Query, no matter what kind of calendar we have. If this video has helped you, then please let me know in the comments. Then after that, why not subscribe and then click there for more Power Query goodness. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.